Well, it's John Reed, and it's that time of year we're kicking off the Enterprise season, and who better to do that with than Brian Summer? How we doing? I'm doing just fine, John, and I'm really looking forward to heading back out to uh, McCarran and grabbing my Southwest, uh, you know, oh, yeah. coach seat home. Absolutely. Bad news for the listeners, you might have to sign an NDA to listen to this podcast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and some of us just will not do that. Yeah. Um, we are at the Oracle combined event. It's an Oracle CX and MBX event, but basically modern customer and business experience is where we are right, right. now. And there's a whole bunch of analysts here, and we're in Las Vegas appropriately enough, which is where a lot of this stuff seems to go down. Now, you're showing me that we're actually missing another event, uh, the Distressed well, Investing Summit. I'm really bummed that we're not there. Yeah, because I can tell that's going to be a real upbeat outfit, you know, talking about <laughs> bankruptcies and restructuring and everything oh, else. Man. I can't believe we're not going to be there for that one. But uh, I wonder knows? if they're going to have a lot of mantles there. You were familiarizing me with the new yeah. lingo. Yeah, I was showing John uh, something that popped up on my tweet screen today uh, was a uh, a. What's a mantle? A mantle is an all male panel. Oh my conference. goodness! But these guys are also tracking this one group. They're also tracking Wannels, the all white panel, and the Manferences, which is an all male co- conference. conference. Oh so, my um, god! Uh, you know, I, I, I can't believe I've probably been to two thousand events, and I somehow I missed all these hashtags in the past. So we'll have to all do right. a better job in the future. I have a feeling we're going to see some mantles this year, but anyhow, let's uh, let's get to the matter at hand here. So, All right, it, so we're we're two days into this event. Uh, what what are you learning so far? What what's the takeaways here? I think to me, uh, there's a significant amount of focus on bot AI and other kind of enabling technologies, and how they're going to normally be embedded within the product lines that um, Oracle has. I mean, we were hearing about that in CX talks, HR mm-hmm. talks, and everywhere else. So, uh, and it's not just about a chat bot. It's about using bots with other things like machine learning, natural language processing, and the like. And I know, John, you and I have really made fun of vendors who, you know, uh, I, I know one year, I think it was last year or the year before, I saw something like 10 out of 11 demos of Alexa-like demos all failed spectacularly in the user conference. Mm. And now even today I saw one where they, these vendors are clearly learning their lesson. They've actually got an Alexa device in a polycarbonate cone so the audience noise doesn't mess up the uh, the technology when they're doing the demo. Mm. This stuff was pervasive at this event. Yeah, you know, it was interesting because we had a, there was a panel this morning uh, with a couple Oracle folks on it, and it was talking about customer data platforms, and the whole the thing I liked about that panel was basically it started with the acknowledgement that for all the CX hype that we hear from all vendors today, including Oracle, but a lot of others, that, that there's a real challenge in terms of providing a unified data experience. And without that, for a customer, it seems like every time you're interacting with a company, you're starting from scratch or you're on a new channel, they don't know who the hell you are. And I asked them a question. I said, are we getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here? Because on, on the one hand, we're talking about what do we do about the data? Like, how do we break down these data silos that, to, that make customer experience so sucky so much of the time? But on the other hand, we're launching ahead with these next-gen projects. I use the example of a chatbot because a lot of times if you go on an enterprise software vendor site now, like as soon as you log on, there's a chatbot that's in your face trying to figure out why you're there. I was on one the other day that all you could do was choose between like support, sales, like one other. Like you couldn't even say I'm researching or whatever. And it was just bothering you. It was in the middle of the screen. Now Oracle, in their defense has a more elegant use of that technology on their site where you can initiate a sales chat. But I think it's a really interesting example of how, on the one hand, this technology is charging ahead, but without the data to supply it properly, are you going to have a good experience? Anyway, that's the what's experience. On my mind. I, I, I struggle with the experience because I think a lot of these technology. what a lot of people don't realize is as powerful as some of the machine learning is, These things actually take a fair bit of coding to make uh, Mm -hmm. come to life, and frankly, and I wrote about this in the uh, in one of my my last month and brief pieces about how all of these transaction systems were really oriented around showing people 
transaction data mm-hmm. and possibly producing reports, often financial reports. Whereas when you start using this new NLP chat kind of technology, you're not looking for a report or a transaction. You're looking for an element of data. Mm-hmm. And we've never designed systems to just give us an answer. They give us reports or URLs, but not an answer. And that is work that still has to be done. And Mm. more importantly, for a lot of companies, they've got a lot of work to do to get their their data standardized, uh, cleansed, structured, and um, other uh, housekeeping items to get ready for a bot-driven kind of world. Totally agree. But there's a design element, too, because having to type leave me alone into a chat bot on a site so I can get information is not a step forward for me. I that, would agree. That's okay. a step back. And and I think it's one of those things where companies need to own up to this customer experience thing and and embrace the fact that you can't play a cynical game of of Oh yeah, well, eighty percent of the visitors on the site pick support or service or whatever. So who cares about the ten or twenty percent that didn't appreciate? That's the game that's being played right now, in my opinion. It's I think it's a very cynical game because it's about gathering data. Oh, our our email opt-ins jumped up, our click-through rates jumped up because we bothered people more often. We don't care about the ten percent that unsubscribed, whatever. That's to me. That's that's the real weak link here. Is that if if customers are so powerful, then why are companies so willing to just annoy us all the time? That's my question. Maybe you have an answer. <laughs> well, this is a first because usually I'm the guy that's always on the rant. And, you know, and uh, John, yeah, here, yeah, sorry, John really has really uh, taken it further than I probably yeah, would. Have sorry, today. buddy. But um, uh, I'll pile one one piece on. I'll give you an example. I think we're also not thinking broadly enough about the power of these technologies. And I'll give you an example. I want a chatbot that doesn't tell me. You know, if I ask it a question like, "Hey, uh, chatbot HR, tell me how much vacation time I have left." Or better still, how do I add a new dependent now that my spouse maybe had a a child? Mm. Well, I don't want them to return a textual answer that I have to Mm. go figure out how to go into the HR system and apply that answer. No, instead what I want it to do with with the... emergence of 5G telephony coming around, I want to see a f- video full streaming, uh, you know, uh, uh, image kind of deal that's walking me through that. If if the software itself can't do that automatically through a workflow-enabled mm. solution. Mm. So what I want is I'm going to chat bot that delivers 5G video and ha- is empowered with workflow to do 99% right. of the activity itself. Yep. But that's not what current systems are designed to do. No. Uh, there's a couple things that I think really worked well at this event. Um, I like these smaller scale events better a lot of times than the massive conferences. This is not open world, obviously. Yeah. Um, I, I was uh, put in front of a number of customers, and it was easy to talk with other customers. We had lunch with another today. Um, one of the things I was intrigued by is that technology, this actually comes out of your book, so we can do a book plug. One of your the- themes in your book you have coming up on Digital with Impact is this notion that technology constraints are not nearly as intense as they were in the past. Correct. And that's something that keeps coming up in these customer interviews where um, interviewing, like I interviewed Home Services, which is a massive real estate segment within Berkshire Hathaway, and then yesterday I interviewed um uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, which I already wrote about today. Both of these are massive transformation projects where the software is 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 the platform that they want for the future for their businesses. I think where where we're waiting a little bit on some of these is for the the real like deep results to come in. Like, okay, you're going to get off some legacy systems. We all know that, but how are you going to serve customers better? It looks like you'll be able to. It's just going to take some time for these products to mature, but what's encouraging about them is the technology's there, and and they're talking in terms of people, process, and technology change, which Mm -hmm. is a really encouraging conversation to have. Um, So heard a bunch of those, and and then you brought me into a really great one this morning. Uh, which was with IBVI. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, but I think that was an extraordinary discussion. Uh, yeah, and, I, and anybody who knows me knows I'm kind of a, 
hard piece of cheese when it comes to uh, <laughs> tough nuts crack yeah, throughout um, the cliches. Yeah, oh yeah, go ahead, keep piling on. Um, but I'm not easily impressed, I guess, and uh, I'm a hardened uh, kind of guy. But this was uh, an organization that uh, provides employment opportunities for individuals who have um, um, who are blind or deaf or other kinds of uh, disabilities or, mute or some combination of the combination. Their employee yeah. of the year. Was, was deaf, all dumb, three and mute? Amazing! Uh, it was amazing. amazing. Absolutely, yeah. this was probably and, and these folks actually bought pretty much everything Oracle has to offer in the cloud, mm-hmm. and they're almost uh, through implementing most all of it. And they had uh, probably one of the best implementers I've ever run into who worked with them on Let's it. Let's give them a name drop. Iteria. Yeah, Iteria us. And I don't have a problem pitching it, and I'll tell you why, guys. Because in a day and age where I see so many integrators who just want to phone in and install, these guys actually figured out and worked with the client on how to how to help somebody who's like blind be able to navigate all the screens uh, and reports in the system. They found additional technologies to bolt on and use with the product, and they are transforming the daylights out of the technology of this company to help it scale and offer more employment opportunities for more people with disabilities. You know, you you couldn't sit there, in my opinion, I don't know how anybody could sit there and, and... be part of the interview that I brought in on and not be personally affected by yeah. that. How, uh, what, what did you think? Same. I mean, I thought it was, it just, when you run into people with that much conviction and determination to not only be successful, but to make the world better. I mean, this is one of my big themes is that the people and the talent are out there. You just have to know how to diversify into so-called non traditional talent pools instead of saying right. the talent's not there how do you tap into the talent which is exactly what these folks are doing and they're talking about how when you, when you have an impairment of some kind like if you're blind other parts of you become very well developed like perhaps your mathematical brain mm-hmm. um, and so tapping into that talent and and the great thing about it from a next gen tech perspective is that it also pushes a vendor like Oracle because the way you think about it is like a chatbot for someone who can't speak. A chatbot becomes like like a typing bot becomes incredibly important. It's your way of interacting, or the same with conversational interface if you're blind. So it's not just a nice to have. It becomes what you depend on. And so as a result, from a design perspective, to to include those populations, and you have to push the envelope on the capabilities, and that's what's I think an exciting opportunity for Oracle is to work with a company like this and say, hey, we're going to have the best next gen stuff out there because it's got to be, otherwise these people can't use our system. Well, let's take that next gen comment a step further. What surprised me were okay. So, what good is a natural language processor Alexa type deal to someone who's deaf? Right. Or it made you rethink in that conversation we had with these folks. And it was even as short as it was, uh, we were probably with them 45 minutes to an hour. I know we only barely scratched the surface what these uh, folks were, uh, you know, have dealt with. But it made me rethink, like, we need to look at all these new enabling technologies, machine learning, artificial intelligence, natural language processing, bot technology, and on and on and on. There's like 80 or 100 of them out there that are hot right now on the market alone. And we got to ask ourselves, are we really doing a good enough job as an industry to make these things really click and work for 100% of the population, not right. just the maybe 85% of the population that has no disabilities to speak of right now. Right, and and part of the theme, when you I, I, the design for all theme that you're describing there, the, the notion is that when you when when you can reach everyone, when you can when you can make uh, conversational AI work well enough for a blind person that that's all they need, you're going to make that interface a lot better than it would have been for you or me. Yeah. And 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 one of the things that came out of the discussion that I think is important is is that they do have challenges um, as Oracle updates their cloud software. They just went through uh, an update, yeah. and, and they have challenges with their integration because you can't have anything break when you're dependent on certain services that you need. And and so Oracle's going to have to step up, I think, with them a little bit in the future on that front. But that's that's good for Oracle and good for them ultimately, so hopefully that will happen. But 
but but they're pushing the envelope in all the right ways. And it's so cool to talk about those technologies in a way that it's not just whiz bang cool, but this is how we empower our workforce. Without that, we don't. This changes people's lives. Yeah, in a very material and profound way. And I, I, folks, we're not going to be able to recap an hour's worth of an interview because yeah, it was yeah. amazing and intense. It absolutely was. But I would tell you, I'm sitting there thinking through things like, how does IoT look and work in their environment going forward? Or more importantly, I realized like, graphical visual dashboards have no value to some of these people unless you right. come up with a different way to get the, if you will, the insights and the answers across. It would make it makes you sit back and think, and I think for that reason alone, it was an extraordinarily worthwhile interview. Absolutely. Uh, another quick shout out: how to because um, I've been looking a lot at different partners, and um, I really enjoyed hearing presentations from a guy named uh, Hope, I hope I don't butcher his name too bad, Taj Forer, the co-founder and CEO of uh, Fable. They're um, an Oracle content strategy partner on the on the marketing side, um, but the whole theme there is about storytelling and how the power of storytelling in B2B and how <laughs> for all our analytics tools that we have to measure the results of all of our campaigns, we really a lot of times don't do a good job of engaging people with stories that matter. You know, and, and so I think that was a really neat thing to, to learn about how they're offering that and also one of, one of the big themes of that is, you know, don't don't just expect people to read 100 page PDFs anymore. You know, and so much about content now is about thinking about how to make it easy for people to consume the stuff they want in the form they want. And like those conversations are happening here as well. And that's, that's really good because the thing is that today's enterprise buyer has a lot of choices and is very distracted and they're not going to put up with old stale crap anymore. Like, and and if you can tell stories that resonate with them and make a difference in their lives, that's a big deal. Now, granted, that's not easy to do, but I found it really refreshing to hear those conversations from, from Fable. So that was the other highlight for me. Well, one of the things I noticed, and I'll, yeah, I'll point this out to folks, there were a lot of sessions here that were marked with a title that had something to do with transformation. Mm. And I'm not... And, and, folks, I'm not denigrating the tremendous change a lot of companies have gone through with a lot of their systems as they've upgraded them to or um, acquired these new solutions from uh, cloud products from Oracle. But a lot of what people are describing as transformation, it may have been a lot of work, and they may feel that's what it was, but it really wasn't the kind of transformation that we're talking about, like these big, gigantic, like digital transformation deals. These right. were mostly getting rid of like mountains of spreadsheets and other kinds of um, stuff that has been an inhibitor to growth. Right. And if you know, uh, if you haven't heard this conversation at your firm already, I will tell you right now that boards of directors all over the place are really putting pressure on companies to grow in an outsized fashion, not not grow at GDP or cost of living, inflation rate kind of rates. They want 10, 15, 20 percent a year, if not every quarter. And this is the kind of pressure that I know is bothering like chief HR officers who are struggling just to even fill the open spots they have today. They're not winning the war for talent, and I think others are going to have to find new ways to look at uh, uh, propelling growth without adding headcount. And I think we're going to see a more of these kind of stories, and I think it's unfortunate they get tarred with the name or painted with the name of transformation when they're really more like, we need to modernize, maybe it would be a better way to put it, but they're not really transforming just yet. That's to come, in my opinion. Yeah, and um, when I talk with uh, uh, Jack Amaral of Blue Cross Blue Shield, to your point, I thought it was really compelling what he was talking about because he... He said um, when he first joined the company four years ago, this is Blue Cross Blue Shield, Michigan, which is a huge healthcare provider. Uh, we operate on four different ERP systems, four different general ledgers. We got thousands of manual journal entries each month. We spent hundreds of hours every month reconciling data and using spreadsheets. And so I, I said to him, like, basically, you're not, as a finance team, you're not able to really have time to analyze the data to your point right. and build new business models. And he's like at your he's like you're spot on. He's like 
he's like, basically the extent of our insight is, well, we sold more contracts, we sold more policies, but they don't know why. And what he said was that, he said, tomorrow, when, when they're done with this go-live, we'll have one repository for all of our data. We'll be able to drill down if the number looks different and unusual. We'll be able to get a true perspective on what is driving change. We don't have that today. And so the whole theme of the whole thing is about he wants to dramatically transform the lives of all these users. And so what, what's interesting in the article then is how does he get users on board with that change? And how does he get management to buy into that? But that's the whole transformation story is the entire thing. It's not just one piece, you know. So those companies, and I've run it, I ran into dozens of them when I was researching for the book, and what I found is kind of like on a Maslow's hierarchy of needs, at the bottom level, there are what I call dysfunctional companies. They're the next level up are ones that are functioning, but right. like making sausage in legislation, you really don't want to know how they're paying the bills or getting their products made. It's right. It could be a really bad thing uh, to look at. And then you have those that are process excellent, and then you have those, a few that can actually get out there and start thinking about transforming the way things happen in their industry. What right. I ran into is that a significant number of companies out there, probably half or more, are functioning. That's all they are. They are functioning. It's not pretty. It's not elegant. Right. They may have way too many spreadsheets. They, they lose parts on, and then suddenly find them st- stored somewhere in a warehouse they weren't expecting. It's unbelievable what the kind of stuff I ran into to the point that when I ask execs to self-score them, Mm-hmm. Many of them describe their firms as borderline between functional and dysfunctional. If mm-hmm. they lose a key people, key system goes down or whatever, they're in a world of hurt. And I'm not sure I would call it transformational. I'm not trying to be a real sticker on the word. Yeah, yeah. It is a big change. Don't get me wrong. I, I get it. But they're not really ready to transform anything as far as like their position in the industry or their space mm. because they need to, they really, what it is, is long deferred housekeeping that should have been done ages yeah. ago, maybe under a different administration. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think you're absolutely right about that. I, I think that the thing that I found interesting in this particular discussion is, uh, when he talked about, um, the cloud transition and, and just avoiding the IT burden going forward. And he talked about that he wants to spend his time and energy thinking about a new operating model for the business. I get it. And that's, and that's like the part that is more transformative, right? Because a lot of these projects are really strictly more about the technology change, right? And not about, you need to be able to talk about what your new operating model is going to look like. Mm-hmm. Um, now, a lot of that you won't be able to experience until you get on there. But you can start planning for it. You can start thinking about it, and you can start preparing for it. But, yeah, to your point, a lot of that isn't transformative yet because it hasn't happened. So your good buddy, uh, Mr. Dennis Howlett, uh, he, taught oh, yeah. me, he taught me an expression that I've used repeatedly, and it's called the dog's breakfast. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what a lot of these folks have is yeah. their systems are just one unappetizing pile of junk that's stitched together and barely hanging on there, and that has to change. I, I would... Um, if I could, well, I tell you what, I think we've probably we, flogged that we're, enough. We're, yeah, we're kind of sparring on the word choice, but uh, yeah. but I think we're both coming to the same point, which is there's a lot of prep work that a lot of companies have to do. And you can't really rush in and start, you know, wiring up your firm for as a factor of the future if the back office is a mess. Right. And uh, so, folks, you know, you may need to get some help and hire some janitorial service to help you come in and clean some of this stuff up yeah. before you can move into the future. Yeah, fair enough. All right, we should wrap pretty soon, but I just want to take a quick pot shot at the experience economy. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, I mean, I, re- I read the book many, many years ago. <laughs> I, I, think it, I think vendors have to be careful about this transition experience economy and how the language is used. I mean, I don't know if you can provide a, if you find that to be compelling language, I think it needs some precision. Uh, having been to a few events that feature all kinds of, all things customer experience, CX kind of oriented, mm-hmm. I'm, I am habitually pissed off and blown away at the same time at how every vendor seems to think that uh, customer experience is somehow equivalent to what salespeople can do to a customer. 
And it has yeah. nothing to do with what is the customer really experiencing with your company, your products, its website, all of its touch points. They haven't got a clue and they don't want to know. And they also mm. don't know what the customer is also experiencing with the competition and everything else. That never comes up in the conversation. And uh, you've got vendors hawking tools that let salespeople, like two seconds before they enter into a customer's site to do a sales call, just look at the latest list of emails and complaints, whatever, coming from your firm mm. uh, to help them guide a way to uh, structure a sales call. And that's not what people necessarily want. And I'm not sure, yeah. you know, the systems are really getting us to the kind of experiences customers really want mm. as opposed to the experience experiences salespeople want to have. The mm. two are not necessarily the same. Mm. Yeah. I th I'm, I'm not saying the lingo is irrelevant. I'm just saying I think we need to really sharpen, be critical about how, how we use it instead of running around saying that we need to have great experiences all the time when, in fact, a lot of times I feel really powerless as a customer. Like, I, I went straight from a customer experience thing upstairs to refresh, and I take a, one of the worst showers I've had in my life at this hotel. What am I supposed to do, move hotels? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, like there's, we're, I think a lot of times customers are locked in. And uh, now, that doesn't mean that companies can't excel by doing things in a smarter way, but I think we have to be really careful about what this lingo means and how powerful the customer really is. Because I think our power through the course of a given day shifts constantly. You know? But anyhow, that's well, probably a whole other but, podcast. But, but actually, you're, you're right on the tip of something really powerful, and that is consumers are re and regulators are really throwing up some major uh, headwinds, uh, particularly in Germany. Uh, Germany right. is going after Facebook like you wouldn't believe, right. trying to stop all this aggregation of personal data. Which, which you brought up before we started taping of like the creep factor and all this, yeah. the creepy factor. And in fact, if I want a great customer yeah. experience, I want, the, I want to surprise a supplier from time to time or a salesperson who didn't know I was doing yep. some of these things, as opposed to somebody calling them going, hey, we noticed you were on this the website yesterday, and I'm like, really? Click. That's the end of that customer experience. I, I don't want any, I don't want somebody tracking my every move around the internet. Yeah. That's not why I bought a smartphone. Right. Well, all right. We might as well stop. I we might have already gone too far to get an invite back next year, but it was it was fun this year anyway. It was, it was. <laughs> and it was a good show. But um, and we ran out of time for your book plug. But but just real quick on the on your digital with impact book, which I'm reading a proof copy now. When is that supposed to come out? Hopefully in just a few weeks. Okay, cool. All right, so maybe in our next sit down, we'll dig into a few more themes from that. But good okay. luck wrapping it up. Thanks, Thanks Brian. All right, thanks, John. Have fun at Southwest.